Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Speed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where... We came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and teach you on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAA. It's one 450 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalaya. Delighted to be here with you. I am your host as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. Our first email comes in from MXU. MXU writes and says, Hi, Noah. I have a question related to installing a new different distro on an existing Linux desktop that has a few extra hard drives internally connected to it. These extra hard drives beyond the regular boot drive are really only extra space and used for photos and other media. In the past, when I only have one extra hard drive, I would physically disconnect the extra drive, installing the new distro. And then after the OS install, I would update the FSTAB file with the relevant extra extra drives info, making it a permanent mount point. But now I have several of these extra drives internally connected to the machine, and so it would be more convenient to simply install the new distro without having to disconnect all the extra drives. Am I safe to install the new distro without messing with the extra drives as long as I select the right boot drive during installation? I do have backups of the data from these extra drives, but it would be a real pain to have to recopy all the photos and media to the extra drives just because of a new distro install. I have no problem updating the FSTAB file after the install to provide a permanent mount point for these extra drives, but please let me know what you think. Love the show. Keep up the great work. Best regards, MXU. So I will tell you that these days, the installers are actually really good if you're, if you're watching as you're going through the install process, paying attention to which drive you're on. And so they actually, a lot of them will have a, have a, nuke it all button that basically says, hey, no matter, just take over all the space, take over all the drives, use them however you want, but this was the operating system I want to use on my system. Now, if you click that button, um, you may, you will lose data uh, on your other drives. But if you're being intentional about it, when you get to the drive partitioning, you'll see different drives broken up. If you have any that are the same make or same model, um, that's when I strongly would encourage uh, disconnecting the drive or being aware of the serial numbers. Um, that are on the drive so that you can make sure you're, you're talking to the right one. But if you know for sure, like let's say uh, your boot drive is a, a one terabyte NVMe drive and all of these quote unquote extra drives are all SATA drives that are in the 250, 500 gig range, something like that. Well, you know what you're installing and what you're not installing to. And yeah, there's absolutely no problem in installing to the M.2 and ignoring all those other drives. Now, I will tell you this. I did have a situation in where and I never did actually look into this to determine why this was, but it wouldn't, if you installed, let, so let's say I had, I had a laptop and, and it had two hard drives. Let's call them A and B. It wanted to install the bootloader to drive A. I wanted it to install the bootloader to drive B. If I installed the bootloader to drive B, the system just wouldn't boot. Even if I changed the boot order to boot drive B. Had to be on drive A on that particular laptop. And like I say, I'm kind of kicking myself now for not ever having going back. And in that particular case, I didn't care. I just, okay, well, it has to be installed there. Um, I never went back and looked as to why that is. So you may run into a situation like that. But if you have previously booted off the drive and you're, it's simply just a reinstallation of the operating system with a different distro, yeah, I would say you're more than fine, MXU, to leave those drives connected. Just pay attention to what you're doing and good on you for having them backed up because... Anybody can make a mistake. Our second email comes in from Austin, or excuse me, Richard from Austin, Texas. Richard writes in and says, on a recent show, you recommended the Sony WH-1000XM4 headphones, and you said that you use them all the time with Linux without any real issue. I have a set of these headphones, and I agree with you. They are fantastic headphones, but I've had a horrible time getting them to work on my Linux laptop. With my Android phone, they're flawless, but using them with my Pop! OS laptop has been a disaster. The outgoing sound was always solid, but I was getting garbled sound from the mic and couldn't be heard clearly on our conference calls or recordings I made. I think the problem is related to some combination of Bluetooth 5 and the LDAC protocol. I gave up trying to fix it for a while and bought a pair of Corsair HS70 wireless non-Bluetooth headset that I use and works great, but I would love to know if you have some special sauce that you use to get these Sony headphones working properly or if yours just worked out of the box. Thanks for the info you can provide. I enjoy listening to the show, Richard. Um, so I 
frankly, so my Sony's stay paired to my Sailfish OS device 99.999% of the time. And that remaining one percent, like 0.1%, it's because I'm traveling and I'm watching a movie on my laptop. And then I'll pair them uh, to the uh, to the laptop. Part of what I like about all good headphones should have a wired backup because that's my preferred way to 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 interact with a different system. I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, we go into another email, but um, I, I think maybe once or twice I've tried the microphone functionality. I'm aware that it's there in my head. I've always told myself, oh, it'd really be nice that the headphones that I have this microphone in case I ever do a call. Um, but typically if I'm doing a work call, I'm sitting in my office or I'm sitting in front of a much nicer microphone and, and, and headphones for doing that. Um, so I'll dig into it and, and see if, if, um, if, if things have changed or if I too had trouble and just had never realized that there was an issue with um, with the, with the microphone portion of them. So thanks for bringing that to my attention. I appreciate it. And for bringing it to the attention of anybody who was maybe considering uh, a set of those headphones, like our next email from Chris. Chris writes in and says, hello, Noah. Within the last year, my 10 year old son has been diagnosed on the autism spectrum. Some of the factors for him are touch more specifically for my question, noise sensitivity. Right now I'm looking to get him a good set of noise canceling headphones. I'm not an audiophile. And so I don't know how to interpret a lot of the specifications that are being presented. Would you please go over things like frequency range, passive versus active noise cancellation, driver unit size, et cetera, so I can get a better understanding of the technology behind the headphones and so I can learn the differences between what is marketing speak and what I actually need to pay attention to. With all of that, could you give me some recommendations for a set of over-the-ear headphones that would be good in a very noisy classroom? Think 10 to 20 kids when an in-person learning is back and has a microphone for remote learning that I can connect to his laptop or Android device. We've received some government assistance for this purchase, so costs can be mitigated as long as they're not extreme. Thanks in advance, Chris. So that's a great question, question, Chris, and thanks uh, to you for, uh, as a father for reaching out to give your kids um, the tools that they need to, to succeed in an environment. I think it's great. You know, when I was going through school, uh, there was often times where I, I, I saw numerous times myself and other kids would say, hey, can we have access to this piece of technology to help us do X, Y, Z? And the answer was, no, it's a toy. You don't need it, right? So these days, I'm glad that we're paying more attention to, hey, how can we utilize this technology to make, uh, because not everybody learns the same way. So uh, good on you for doing that. I'll do the best I can to break it down for you. So frequency range is simply the ability of the speaker or headphone to reproduce sound of a given frequency. So what do you look for in a set of headphones? Well, let's start with what the human ears can hear. The human hearing range is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, and we abbreviate 20,000 hertz by calling it 20 kilohertz. And so when you're looking for headphones or other devices, anything outside of that range isn't particularly helpful to us in the sense of reproducing sound that we could hear. Now, I thought very briefly about doing this demonstration in a podcast, mostly because I can, um, decided against it because I thought it might be annoying to listen to, but you can go repeat this experiment at home. Open up Audacity, and inside of Audacity, click on the Generate tab, go down to Tone, and generate a 25,000 hertz tone, or 25,000. And generate that tone and listen to it. And what you're going to hear is, well, what you won't hear is, uh, is two things. You will see in the waveform that there's a waveform there. And if you have like a, a little Mackie mixer or if you have um, another computer that you can plug it into, you'll actually see the view meters peg. Like they'll go up because there is sound there. But likely your speakers or headphones won't be able to reproduce it. And even if they can reproduce a 20,000 hertz tone, there's very few of you listening to this episode that would actually be able to hear that tone. It's going to sound like silence to you. And so getting a, a, a headphone or a speaker that, you know, has crystal clear sound at 21,000 hertz or 22,000 hertz is obviously not something we prioritize. Whereas when we're talking about good performance in that 20 to 20 kilohertz range that we do care about. So going back, if I was going to pick up a, 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 head, a set of headphones to start with, I'm going to start with the with those Sonys because, like I say, I, I really believe that the WH-1000XM4 are the best Bluetooth headphones available today. Um, so let's take a look at those. If we look at the frequency range from Sony, we see that the frequency range is 4 hertz to 40,000 hertz. So well in excess, almost 20,000 hertz on each side um, of what the human ear can hear. Why would Sony do that? Well, part of it is a function of 
when we're building headphones or speakers or microphones or whatever, um, if we can get outside of the human range and we can pick up a little bit over that, and then the, 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 the low side and the high side that we can make sure to, 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 to encompass everything that humans can actually hear. But there's another component here, and that is the noise canceling. We'll get to that in a second. The second thing you're going to see, and this is primarily going to apply with Bluetooth headphones, um, and that's the sampling rate. And, and here's why. In a traditional audio system, like if I just took a, uh, if I went back, if we went back to a phonograph, we took a record player and connected a pair of headphones, physically plugged them in. Um, what we would understand is that we're recording a waveform into uh, the vinyl, and then a needle is going through that and going up and down those those little divots, and that's recreating those those same frequencies, um, which are then sent to an amplifier, amplified and sent to our ears. In that scenario. All, every time I speak or all of my voice or all of my musical instrument is being, uh, is, is being, is being scratched into that piece of vinyl with, with a needle. When we go to digital recording, obviously we're not doing that. Now we're taking samples. We're taking samples very, very quickly and very, very frequently. And what that allows us to do is build a cohesive picture of what that sound looks like. And so when you see a sampling rate of 44.1 kilohertz uh, sampling, what that's saying is 44.1 thousand times per second, it's listening to that audio and, and capturing pictures of it. And that's what it's using, um, to, to, to record the sound. So the higher the sampling rate, the more accurate, um, it's going to be in the lower, the sampling rate, the, the, the less accurate it's going to be. Now, 44.1 kilohertz is essentially indistinguishable to human ears. Um, and so that's good. That's about what you wanted. It's, it's where, what every CD recording, or what every recording studio in Nashville, um, it's either 44.1 or 48. Um, when you start looking into, um, going wireless, things get a little bit more complicated because now we have to encode that audio. We have to send it over a wireless system and then we have to receive it on the other side. And that encoding and decoding, um, carries the potential for loss. Also, we have to encode it at a specific bit rate. So the MP3 that you're listening to, if you listen to this on the podcast side, we encode it at 96 kilobits per second. And that's a perfectly fine encoding rate for speech. If you downloaded a, a, a high quality MP3, the highest quality MP3 you can get, you would see that that MP3 is around 320 kilobits per second. So when Sony comes out with their LDAC protocol at 96 uh, at a sampling rate of 96 kilohertz and a bit rate of 990 kilobits per second, we, we can tell by that information two things. One, the sampling rate is higher than likely the source recording was, and the bit rate is higher than any standard MP3. And so with their LDAC protocol and their encoding and decoding, you're unlikely to hear any of the, artif the encoding artifacts because it's not being limited by the Sonys and their, con their Bluetooth connection back to the device. It's being limited by the, the file itself. Now, if you look at something like an actual CD, we would see that those are somewhere in the 2000 plus bit rate. Um, and, and, and so it's, it's almost 10 times the quality of a very high quality MP3. And so people like me who really want to hear music in, its, in, in, in the best possible way and preserve music in the best possible way, shy away from things like MP3. And we, stay to, we stick to things like Wave and Flack. Um, I tell you all of that, not because you care about listening to mp3s it's primarily you're you're interested in noise cancellation and and, and and removing your son um from some of these things but it's important to understand how encoding and decoding works so that you can understand when sony says hey there's this ldac thing and it's a 96 kilohertz sampling rate and 909 kilobits per second well that's very good for listening to mp3s not so good for listening to uncompressed music um Driver size, when you start talking about driver size, essentially there's a couple of components in every headphone that makes it a headphone. It's a magnet, a diaphragm, and a voice coil. And there are some more advanced uh, headphones like stacks that are electrostatic uh, headphones, but most headphones that you're going to look at have a magnet, a diaphragm, and a voice coil. And the way it works, the magnet creates the magnetic field. The voice coil um, is, is, what move, is, what, is what's moving the, the diagram and creates the sound that you hear when that electric current passes through the voice coil. And then the, the diaphragm is, the, is the, what actually vibrates to recreate those sound waves from what it got from the voice coil. 
And so typically, the larger the coil, the better the base is going to be, the cleaner it's going to be, the crisper it's going to be, the smoother it's going to be. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the larger the driver, the better the headphones. There are plenty of very small driver headphones and earphones in the case of um, the, the, the Apple Buds and the Samsung Buds. They're, they're very good quality, um, comparatively speaking. They're very good compared to other earbuds, even though they have teeny tiny little drivers. Um, by comparison, I have a set of earphones uh, that are, they're a set of custom in-ear earphones that I use uh, when I'm playing drums during worship. And, and those are a four driver system. And so they have one high driver, one high mid driver, one low mid driver, and one low driver. And the idea behind those four drivers is it allows me to get more clarity at a lower volume because the name of the game when, when you're a percussionist is keep as much sound and, and the volume as low as humanly possible. And then outside of that, we want to isolate as much as possible. And hence the idea of in ear molded. It blocks sound completely from outside. And then what is being put into my ears is at the lowest possible level in the clearest possible way. So that takes us, dovetails nicely into our discussion of active versus passive cancellation. Active noise canceling is, uh, is, is based on a premise that if I take a recording of an audio wave and I invert that recording of, of, of a waveform, and I send it back at itself, it will cancel itself out. And that's called an antiphase. And so the way that noise-canceling headphones work is basically they have little tiny microphones all over the, the, the cups, and they, they, they take in all of the outside noise, and then they electronically generate the opposite uh, waveform, and, and that is what actually cancels out the noise. And so if you're looking for the best possible way to cancel noise electronically, uh, it's active noise canceling. Now we can get there in a much smaller profile in, 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 in thinner devices, and the only thing that's required is really good microphones, really good headphones, uh, and, and, and this is where we're gonna circle back to our frequency range. Obviously the sound that human ears can hear is, is, uh, is, is 20 hertz to 20,000 kilohertz, but it's nice when those microphones and speakers are capable of reproducing other noises that can then, that, 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 that make sure that none of that audio is getting on, onto the inside of the, the headphones. So how do we do it before uh, active noise canceling? Well, we did it with what you called passive noise canceling. I'm going to call it isolation, and I'm gonna call it isolation because we're not really canceling any noise. We're just stopping noise from getting it through the earmuffs by having a, a good seal around the ear, by adding foam and insulation, uh, by making it thicker, all those kinds of things allow us to isolate um, the listener's ear from the outside environment. And so isolation headphones are a perfectly suitable way um, to achieve uh, to achieve isolation from noise. In fact, again, going back to my drumming example, uh, on the outside of my, on my in-ears, I they do a pretty good job of, of canceling out the noise. Before I had them, I used just regular earphones. And when I did that, I put a pair of what, what's known as isolation muffs over, which are things specifically designed for uh, drummers and really gun enthusiasts and any anything that's loud um, and they're basically a, a really uh, studied pair of earmuffs but we understand exactly how much sound they're reducing and we've measured that and so you can you can use it in, in that, that kind of scientific way and so um, wh what that takes you to is you, you have a couple of different options you can go with a pair of isolation headphones um, which will allow you to reject all of the outside noise uh, and and still allow you to only hear what the headphones are plugged into Anytime you go to um, any sort of noise canceling headphones that are that are really, I guess, worth their salt, if they're Bluetooth, they probably also include active noise canceling um, because they're not built with huge earmuffs and a lot of space and a lot of insulation. They're built with really accurate drivers, really accurate microphones, and good electronics. Um, and so, a couple of options. Again, I'm going to start with um, the Sony's. I think that the Sony uh, WH1000. XM4s are a great place to start. Uh, if you wanted another option to consider, I would also take a look at the Bose Quiet Comfort. Um, had those before I had the Sony's. I had no objections to them whatsoever. They were fantastic. The noise canceling is better in the Sony's. The feature is better in the Sony's. The sound quality is better in the Sony's. And they're only about 60 bucks more than the Bose. Um, but if for some reason you were looking for another option or if uh, you don't like Sony for some reason, then I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. Uh, as, as, as a place that you can go. Our fourth email comes in from John. John says, hey, John from California again. This week, I have a question. In a previous episode of Ask Noah, you said that you're worried 
about the fact that GNOME has the UI on a single thread and it could cause it to fail. What have you found related to GNOME 40? Thanks, John. Well, not a lot, actually, John, and despite, and it's not for a lack of looking, but um, essentially the, the only real reference I found is a, an article on Pharonix that is talking about uh, the Mutter compositor being uh, and, the, and the input work being put to a separate CPU thread. So kind of a, a, a short synopsis of what they're getting at here is because the entire GNOME shell runs as a single threaded process, what John is saying is that when it locks up, you lose everything. And under Wayland, that's particularly uh, catastrophic because it also causes um, the, 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 um, mutter to crash and so it's 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 bad um where people have noticed it or or raised a lot of issues is in the input devices because as that shell locks up even things like your mouse start to lock up and so what they're looking at doing is moving the input thread uh, elsewhere so at least your mouse wouldn't lock up now i've not seen anything that definitively says okay so now we can just we'll spin up new processing threads when when gnome gets overworked it 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 would appear by my limited understanding here that we're still on a single thread. It's just we've, we're able to push one, albeit very critical thing, out into its own thread. Again, 855-450. No, it's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Mark, you're on Ask Noah. Good afternoon. Uh, on uh, hard drive arrays, uh, I want to build a file server. And uh, just for the fun of it, I, I just look into just enrich my uh, knowledge of Linux and systems and so forth. So I already have a NAS. Um, so this is just, again, for fun. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm looking at uh, ideas for different solutions. So I, I've worked a lot with RAIDs, traditional RAIDs. So I'm, I'm comfortable there. But, um, you know, the uh, downside with RAIDs, of course, uh, you have issues with certain file systems or or um, you are stuck to just using specific types of hardware or like keeping all the drives the same. Uh, uh, what uh, can do you have any insight here on, on, on uh, ways to build a drive array for a file system? Sure. What are you, uh, so aside from just an experience, aside from just experimenting with it and kind of learning a little bit about it, um, what are some, what, what would be some of your goals? The reason I ask is this, you can build a, 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 you could build an array with just a bunch of disks, right? It's literally called the JBot array and you could plug them all in and add them all and pool, add up all the storage and just store stuff on it. And that will work. And it, it and it's a very useful way uh, to, to take a bunch of old disks and store a bunch of data across them. And there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, I've seen it done in enterprise for backup scenarios and all sorts of uh, little shoehorn things all the time. Uh, so that that's one way you could do it. The okay. Is, is, uh, how about redundancy and stability for a JBot? Okay. When you start getting into when you start getting into redundancy, that's when you want a, a proper RAID setup. So you could do something like a mirrored array, uh, uh, array, which is essentially just for you know for every one drive that you have, you'll have a second drive yeah. that duplicates the data. The, the other the other thing you could do is go to something like a RAID five, which will allow you um, some some more drive tolerance, so that when you lose a drive, all of your data will still be there because the parity is across the entire RAID array. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, now, I've also read somewhere that Linux does not like hard hardware drive controllers. Uh, are you are you aware of that, or you know, does Linux want to manage each hard drive? Uh, does it prefer to manage each hard drive uh, at a kernel level, or are you know uh, RAID cards okay to use? Do you have any insight on that? I, I've never heard of any issues with Linux itself having an issue. Um, certainly that is an issue in something like FreeNAS, where ZFS very much expects to be able to talk directly to the disk. And the problem with that is if it, 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 it isn't talking directly to the disk and it thinks it is and it calls for, for, for flushing the cache and the system lies, which is possible if it's not talking directly to the disk, then you could potentially lose data, which is why it's highly discouraged. Um, in it, when you're using something like ZFS, but normal, like just a regular CentOS installer and Ubuntu install should be fine on RAID. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Operating systems kind of world mostly do all the same. 
So, uh, yeah, it was just a question of how to manage hard drives. So, uh, okay. All right. That, that kind of clarifies things. Yeah. Thank you for the call. I appreciate you taking the time and thanks for hanging in there. Uh, 855-450-NOAA. That's 1-855-450-6624. The email live at asknoahshow.com. Eddie writes in and says, hello, the first thing I wanted to say is thank you so much for your show. It's one of the things I look forward to each week. All right. Time for my question. My name is Eddie and I'm a junior in high school in a very small town. I'm just feeling overall a bit lost. I love technology. I spend all of my free time learning as much as I can. And I know I want to take up some technological based job for a living. Preferably computer science. My problem is I have no idea where to go to get the job I love. From getting certification to more education, I need I need and how to get a job in IT as a as a huge role model for me. I would love to for any advice that you could give for me. Thanks so much for your time and the show. Well, Eddie, first of all, thanks for listening to the show. Um, I'll start here. There's a couple of different routes you can go down. You can go down the comp sci route or the computer science route, which is what you're talking about. And that's software development. If you want to develop software, go down that route. The other option you can do is go down a support or business side of it. So you'd be doing things like exchange, office templates, helping people with printers, updates, those kinds of things. That'll be handled typically through the business part of your school or a business, uh, a business school or a business program. Uh, you could go down the system administration uh, side, and that's what I do. Servers, Linux, switches, routers, VLANs, voice, access points, VPN, which is kind of the, the, the kit and caboodle, really. Um, if you wanted to specialize in the network, you could go down the network engineer side, and that would be bigger switches, bigger routers, and you maintain the infrastructure that everyone else relies on. Um, as far as you know, kind of some next steps where to go, I would highly encourage you to job shadow. Go see it done in person. Go ask questions. Find out what you like. Find out what what kind of businesses exist and where you might want to work. Um, I'd apply for internships. Google has them. You might find local businesses that have them. You might talk to your local college if they have one or go, go uh, contact an in-state school and see if they have anything. Um, education, for me, it's always a win because knowledge is the one thing nobody can ever take away from you no matter what happens. You could be completely alone in a hole and you'd still have knowledge with you, right? And so I'm, I'm always a fan of education. I'm always a fan of knowledge. Uh, at this point, that would be investing in yourself, right? If you enroll in a program in college or you think about it for a little bit and say, I'm, I'm interested in the network side, the system admin side, the support side, or the comp side, whatever that is, you find that, you find that niche and and invest in yourself and 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 focus on skating to where the plan is going to be as far as certifications go they're good if you have a specific goal in mind if you say to yourself i want to work on red hat systems then the red hat system administrative uh, certification is a great certification to get if on the other hand you say to yourself i just want to work in in system administration i just want to administrate servers i don't really care if they're red hat well it might help you land a job if you have that certification but I've too often seen it happen where somebody comes in and they're so proud of the certification. Now I have XYZ cert and then it's for a specific version and they go, well, we need you to work on this. Well, that's XYZ version 11 and I have certification in XYZ version nine. You know what's like, nobody cares. Um, and so your natural, in, your natural tendency to just love and explore technology is what I would encourage you to pair with a desire to help other people and go serve other people well. And if you, if you focus on those two things, it won't matter so much which one of those four paths you follow, and it won't matter so much which company uh, you wind up serving, provided that you you're, 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 that's where you're coming from is, is a desire to serve other people. And that you, 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 when you interview for a company, that you interview them and make sure it's a company where you will be appreciated and, 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 and you'll have an opportunity to serve them. Uh, my next guest, Matthew Miller is the Fedora Project Lead and a guest this hour on the Ask Noah Show. Hey, Matthew, welcome into the program. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for taking the time. So um, let's. since you were last on the program, uh, we talked about ButterFS going default in Fedora 33. So I guess I'll ask Matthew, uh, what has the response been? Has it has it been a colossal disaster? Has, have, has it been no big deal? Where are we at? It has been no big deal, which was our measure for a success. You know, it's one of those uh, very worrying changes where um, if things go if things go horribly wrong, like it's a no rec like uh, if people lose their data, they will never trust us again. So uh, we were, took 
a lot of pains to make sure that wouldn't happen and to make sure that it went smoothly and we uh, took fairly conservative choices and uh, that seems to have paid off and I have we had a couple people who had problems but they turned out to have hardware problems that um, ButterFS was exposing so that's okay. the system working as designed I guess yeah, absolutely uh, but yeah very very positive response overall um, so pretty happy with that well i'm glad to hear that i also have suffered no ill effects uh, from my fedora 33 installations going strong so i'm excited to talk about fedora 34 um matthew this is it's 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 exciting for a number of reasons we're going to break that down throughout the episode but i want to start with this um true to fedora tradition how are we looking on the timetable so we are on schedule, which means not uh, this week, but on the 27th is the planned release. Uh, this is one of those things that's always been a challenge for Fedora because we do our schedule in the public and because we've never had a strict we ship on this date no matter what policy, nor have we done release when it's ready. We try to have a target schedule and then we try to meet it. Now, for the last like a couple years now, uh, very solidly, like so long that I've forgotten the last time we, we didn't do it, we've actually hit our targets very reliably. So I'm really pleased with that because it's good for our users to be able to plan around it. It's, you know, it's good for the press. Obviously, you like to know when, what's, when things are going to happen. And it's good for us to be able to just you know execute smoothly on our processes. But it's the kind of thing where like, if we were doing this as a commercial product, we would just never tell you what the announce date was until we were absolutely sure about it. And then we would tell you the release date and then there would be, oh, no, no, like, oh, it's late. So uh, the way we've, we've finally worked this out is we have in, in our schedule, which you can find, I think if you search for Fedora Linux schedule, this will probably be the first hit that comes up. We actually have a, you know, a publicly available page of what our current targets are. and we generally have a preferred final target, which we try to hit, and then an, a, um, uh, it's right now it says current final target, but then a, a basically a fallback target. And we don't consider it late as long as we hit one of those targets. If it goes beyond that, um, it's that's a slip, but um, either one of those first two target dates is uh, our on-time goal. So what you're saying it was it was part of the plan from the very beginning to not be on time with the first plan. Yeah. Like we had a plan well, well, when that right. plan didn't work. Well, we give ourselves some buffer in there because uh -huh. the fact is we're you know it's an integration project where you've got thousands of bits of software from you know upstream developers around the world and we're trying to get it all to work nicely together. And so it's always a challenge to do that. So rather than just uh, kind of arbitrarily slipping, we have built into the schedule some padding for. Uh, whether you know we need to do that and that helps our QA people not need to have you know a lot of late night hero work to try and make the date but uh, we also try and make sure that you can plan around that final date pretty reliably awesome I love that I absolutely love that Matthew so Fedora 33 shipped with ButterFS by default now Fedora 34 is enabling um, transparent compression Matthew what is transparent compression and how does that save disk space so it Basically, uh, whenever a file is saved to disk, it uh, does a really quick check to see if it thinks this file could be compressed, and then it transparently compresses it if it can. So uh, that means uh, when you, if you have a, a you know a large file that could be squished, it'll actually use less space on the disk, and then when you go to open it, it will without your application or anything knowing basically uncompress it back again, uh, which on, on my laptop, it saved like uh, 26 gigabytes of space. Wow. And I haven't noticed any performance problems. Uh, uh, I haven't benchmarked it. Um, it's possible even that with um, CPUs as fast as they are, it could, uh, especially if you're on spinning disks, mm -hmm. speed up the time because it actually has to get less data off the disk um, and if you have an ssd in your writing it actually means there's less writes to the disk because it's you know putting less data there that's fantastic that's awesome are are there any other features uh, that you're particularly excited about that that just well I, let me get through all the things i'm excited about and then i'll ask hey, you yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. so uh, uh, ubuntu 2104 isn't going to be shipping with gnome 40 and i was kind of disappointed about that because the gnome team did a fantastic job reaching out to the community and asking 
what do you like about GNOME? What do you wish was improved or different about GNOME? And then really refining the design process around GNOME, around what their users were doing. And it was just this absolutely fantastic effort, a, a ton of really great work and a ton of really great effort all right out in the open, um, exactly the way it should be. And, and so I was kind of disappointed to see that that the Ubuntu users aren't going to be able to take advantage of it. I was, however, really excited um, to learn that Fedora is shipping uh, this this build with GNOME 40. And so what are your general impressions of GNOME 40, Matthew? And, and why did Fedora choose to ship it right away? I am pretty excited about it as well. And I, I think you're right. Um, when GNOME 3 came out and it was a big change, a lot of people were pretty upset. Um, you know, we've everything has been rearranged. I liked it how it was, and so on. And the GNOME team and the designers have really le learned a lesson from that and tried to make sure that you know things are communicated and that the design reflects you know the feedback they're getting from people. Doesn't mean it's perfect for everybody, but they really have been trying to listen and base the designs around that, as you say. Uh, Alan Day, who works on design for Fedora Workstation, has been doing part of part of that work and um, I've been talking with him about it and yeah so I understand Ubuntu's decision because change is hard and scary and from a distro point of view um, we want small incremental improvements continually like that's the ideal like I was talking about Butterfest like we don't want to have big changes that scare people uh, but you like to have things new and nice and so this is uh, when you know the the numbering goes from 3.38 to 40 a big number and you know this is the first really major change to the way gnome shell works since uh, gnome 3 came out although there's been a lot of refinement all along uh, so it's a little scary uh, but i talked to the designers we talked to fedora users you know we put it in uh we put it in for testing um i installed it pretty early on my system and uh, you know, when it comes right down to it, one of Fedora's basic values is first. Uh, we try to um, take the stuff that's coming from the upstream projects and get it to our users in a nice polished state as soon as possible. And um, from our testing and our, the early feedback we got, um, I think it's ready for people. And I think, um, sorry, Ubuntu, you're missing out. Yeah, GNOME 40, it, it is it is an improvement. What have, What's been your impression? Yeah, um, I've been using it on uh, both my main desktop system, my treadmill desk, and my laptop, uh, my other desk where I do video calls and things for, uh, I don't know, m months now? For, for Since it was very early builds of it were available in uh, Fedora's copper, um, basically our uh, user repositories. And um, I'm pretty happy with it, especially actually on, on my main system where I have one big monitor. Uh, I, I love it. I think it's an improvement in every way. My On my laptop where I've got um, one screen above, the, I've got a, a plug-in monitor that's up above the laptop. Um, the layout, I've, I've got to adjust myself a little bit to that because uh, the basic concept is you know, workspaces now are horizontally aligned and it's confusing with the way my... my uh, two monitors are. So I think there's some refinement work for two monitors, um, but for the single monitor, um, it's really perfect. And I think there are people who will like it for two monitors, and I think there'll be improvements coming along there as uh, the designers kind of get more feedback. Was your, is your, your multi-monitor, is it because of the orientation or something of your monitor? Yeah, I oh, it's totally, yeah, it's because of the orientation. I have the one above the other one, and I've, it just feels weird to me. And basically, the, the outcome of that is I've really stopped um, just kind of not by decision, just sort of organically stopped using multiple workspaces mm -hmm. in that layout, um, which is fine. Actually, I've got two monitors. I don't need the virtual workspaces as much. Um, but yeah, like I said, you know, there's some there's some growing pains on that. But overall, I'm really like it, it's pretty snappy. The the overall layout is intuitive. I like having the um, bar at the bottom, although side. I was a window maker user for years before. Uh, I'm used. To, I'm used to the side panel as well. I can, I can adjust to that, um, but everything also feels nice and smooth, and it, it's very pretty to look at um, as an operating system. So that's that's nice. Since we're talking about workflows and, and desktop environments, have you spent any time on the on the i3 spin this time around? I, I haven't actually used it myself, although I I know people are super excited about it. The tiling thing is just not for me. I've tried it um but uh i i don't know 
I, I, I really do like the GNOME workflow, uh, but I know people are very excited about i3. So um, yes, and some of the people who are very excited put this together as a spin. That's one of the things I really like in Fedora, rather than if you want to make a variant of it, um, you'd go and make a you know, like a fork or a derived distro from it, you can actually just do that in the project and make your version, the i3 spin in this case, um, for users who want that experience. Absolutely. Well, I'm I'm thrilled to see that um, so many of these spins are coming out, particularly with alternative environments. And, and like you, I'm not much of a tiling desktop uh, guy. I do have one uh, on my on on one of my work machines because when when you're trying to get down and dirty with a task, there is no more efficient way. And so I'll give credit where credit's due. And and uh, but it's exciting to see that that all of those variants are available. M Matthew Fedora made a decision to switch. Pulse Audio out for Pipewire, and this has in immense value to me, and, and I'm watching it like a hawk because I'm just about at the point where I'm going where I'm going to rip out all of these uh, studio machines and upgrade them all. And as I was searching for operating systems and as I'm looking at what's available, um, that decision really stood out to me. Talk to me a little bit about the decision to go with Pipewire and its ability to mix audio streams with low latency uh, for professional audio users. Yeah, this is something else. It's a, it's again, the you know, we're trying to do these things first. And so uh, when the team working on it said it was ready, we, we tried it out and uh, we think it's ready. So we're bringing it to you. Um, I am not a professional audio person, but I speak to people who are. So I know that's exciting to be able to use the same system that is um, used for everything else rather than having to replace it. And one of the things, I guess there are um, plugins for a thing called Jack, which is the normal um, professional audio system on Linux. And those things work with Pipewire. Um, so uh, it's ni a nice compatible drop-in change. Um, as I understand it, there are some parts still using Pulse in the current release, but those things are going to be slowly migrated over. Um, it's another one of those things where I was worried about it because, you know, uh, if people's audio stops working on their video calls in we're still in a pandemic here like that would be very frustrating and indeed uh, when i first turned this on i tried to turn on the features earlier i had some frustration but within a couple of weeks all of those things were addressed and it seems really uh, most people again will not notice a difference um, and then the people who need more professional uh, configuration will be able to easily do that as well and at the end of the day the pipewire while it is designed with the idea of professionals in mind it's also been designed with the average joe in mind right like like the idea here is that this can run uh a desktop audio it's just desktop audio that has a bunch of more knobs and levers and and things that it can connect to under the hood yeah and you know it, in the end it's it's a thing where everybody benefits from those professional features even if you're not using them and it's nice to have all the energy kind of going into one place so the whole system gets better for everyone that way and uh, in the future it will also have some better features for doing uh, flat pack and containerized applications speaking uh, to audio systems in a secure way. That was one of the things that wasn't in the design for Pulse Audio, and it is for Pipewire. Uh, so it gives us some more capability for the future as well. Matthew, what is System D O O M D, and why has it been turned on by default? And how does that help with out of memory situations? Yeah, it's all. This is a hard thing. Um, basically, um, the Linux virtual memory system. When you run out of memory, uh, it tries really hard to um, get things back for you, but often just gets into kind of a grind that's really painful. Uh, so in some ways, uh, this this is basically a user a user uh, land, like uh, not running in the kernel, but you you know running in the system D space, um, a tool for uh, taking actions. Uh, basically uh, using the C groups, basically a process groups, um, to try and figure out what things should be shut down to try and free up memory when you get that out of memory situation. Uh, this, uh, we uh, we put did a swap on compressed RAM last release, and so this together, uh, we're really trying to make the experience better for people with you know four gigabyte, eight gigabyte systems. Um, I know it's. It's really nicest if you can have a laptop with, you know, 12 or 16 or, you know, more. Um, 
especially you know this is just you know, uh, Chrome and you know Firefox um, and just the web modern web just takes up a lot of RAM so uh, memory is always in short supply and it's just a lot of laptops out there are limited to eight or come with eight and you know uh, we want to make that hardware useful to people so this is part of that that's awesome that, that's that's fantastic and you know matthew it's not just about laptops and desktops there's non-desktop things that are happening in fedora as well yeah absolutely we've got a whole bunch of things there uh so i don't have any exciting features exactly but we have a fedora server edition that uh, something like 30 percent of fedora uses are in non-desktop cases um and so the Fedora Server Edition is kind of a general purpose operating system for those server uses. And the thing that's important here is we've had the working group, which is basically, you know, the team of people who are volunteering to work on this, has been really revitalized in the last couple months and is working on documentation and polish. And so I think if people are interested in using Fedora in a server context, uh, it's a really uh, a great thing to get involved with and or just be a user of and know that there are people who are are caring about it working on it uh, we also have an iot edition for uh, you know building anything from a home you know, home control network to uh, you know bigger uh, large-scale deployments of things uh, running a lot on arm and small devices uh, i've got a jetson nano developer kit sitting on my desk staring at me i'm going to do some things with that sometime sometime soon uh, and so there's uh, that has uh, features that are improving as it's going along it's based on the same technology as core os which uses os tree for doing system updates um, so that you can uh, reliably do an update you know in your remote device and if it doesn't have to, if it doesn't work roll back to the previous one easily easily uh, and then core os which is designed for clusters and um, you know, Kubernetes on top of you know, a base for your Kubernetes systems to run on is also progressing. Um, that comes now in a development stream and a stable stream and a testing stream. So you can kind of uh, do your deployments uh, when as, as new versions of the base Fedora Linux come out, you can uh, roll out to your cluster uh, the different updated versions of it. Uh, and that's uh, we're really starting to see a lot of usage of that as well, which I'm it's it's taken a little while after CoreOS, you know, came into the Red Hat family to find a place and a home and be moving smoothly. But I think that's working really nicely now. Uh, and I've seen quite a bit of usage of that um, in uh, particularly ephemeral systems, cloud systems that don't last for very long. So I'm interested in kind of seeing more what people's usage of that for maybe CI based systems and things is uh, something to explore more. Yeah. Matthew, I want to go back to something you said. You, you, you talked about Fedora Server Edition. I want to ask, who is the target audience for the Fedora Server Edition? I ask that because right now we're at this precipice and where I can get a proper Red Hat license for free under their developer program. I can get a, a CentOS. Uh, I can spin up a CentOS server. Where does Fedora kind of fit into that mix? Or is it more along the lines of Fedora exists to be Fedora? And so if you live in that world and then want to do a server then the world is your landscape. So yeah, I think there that that's that's definitely one of the um, cases. I think there's let me see I'm going to say four and then see if I can remember all the four different different things that I think might might be one. One of them is certainly if you live in the Fedora world, um it's the natural server to use, especially if you are um you know, not going to put it into long scale production. Um, if you are doing that, you might want to target RHEL or CentOS Stream um, for something that has that longer lifespan. But uh, if you're just, you know, if you're in the Fedora world, um, it's a server option for you. Um, another case is when you are planning to target, you know, the, something in the RHEL CentOS world, and uh, but you're you're planning it to go into production a few years from now. Um, you're, you're kind of testing it out. Uh, this is something where you can see what's coming up next and have something where, you know, uh, when, you know, REL 10 comes out, uh, it, it'll, you'll be ready for it, <laughs> REL 9, which, you know, those kind of things. Um, uh, and then another case is simply where you want 
to have the latest versions of the software. You want to have the newest kernel. You want mm. to have you know um, newer newer things coming in. And although uh, Red Hat is working valiantly to provide those things um, with you know more frequent rel releases and with um, the app stream concepts, uh, still uh, Fedora is where the newest stuff lands first. Uh, so. Uh, if you have a fast moving server, uh, that's the case for that. And then finally, uh, Fedora is a place where you can get involved yourself and you can kind of shape the direction of things. You can shape the direction of next rel or you can shape the direction of you know, Fedora for its own sake. Um, and you can have your ideas actually be reflected in things that benefit everybody else. So uh, that's uh, in, in, in the you know, rel Fedora CentOS ecosystem, that's kind of unique. Talking about the IoT edition, this is interesting. How are updates handled with the IoT edition? Is the idea that they, that they will just automatically update and then go to the next version of Fedora when when we hit that six month cycle? Uh, Fedora IoT, like CoreOS and actually like Silverblue as a desktop offering, use a thing called RPM OS Tree. It uses the same package sources as traditional Fedora Linux, but it actually puts them into a thing that looks like a source code, a Git a checkout, a Git tree. And so you update your system by instead of using a pack, a normal package manager that pulls down, you know, basically tarballs and that was some metadata and uncompresses them onto your disk, it actually pulls down the files in a very, way that's very similar to Git and actually has, uh, you, have, you have a commit that shows across the entire OS, like this is um, you, every version of all the packages at a certain date is, ch is checked in. And so you update by uh, basically updating to a newer commit. And if uh, something goes wrong, you update, you can go previously back to a previous commit and find out where the problem was, or you can even do a bisect and figure out, oh, I updated and sometime in the last three weeks, this problem happened. You could actually figure out where exactly that problem happened with a whole set of software that's tested together rather than on a package by package layer. And then for your workload, you actually run that in containers using Podman and or so, OB Engine, if that's your thing. So the so the updates would be handled through those through that OS tree. Yeah, exactly. RPM OS tree takes care of the updates. Oh, one more thing. Uh, we have our beautiful new logo finally. It took a little while for it to get through legal clearance, but we are cleared to use it. I'm really happy with this. Um, it has some nice changes. It works in two colors, which is something we'd struggled with for a very long time. And I am personally pleased that the, the A at the end of Fedora does not look like an O from a distance. One of the top typos coming into our website was Fedoro. And now, hopefully, there will be Fedoro no more, and people will know that that's an A at the end. <laughs> that's awesome. Where can we check out the new logo? You have to wait um, for the release to, to see it. On, on the release day, um, if you install the beta now, it'll be there, of course. Uh, but on the release day, we're going to update all of our social media and the main web pages and things with it. Is the, uh, what's the web? Is it Fedora? Is it FedoraProject.org? Uh, GetFedora.org get is the short download url yeah get fedora.org get fedora.org just one week until release day fedora 34 will be out check it out in all of its flavors and huge thanks to matthew miller and his team for bringing it to us oh it's not my team it's the fedora team they don't belong to me well there you go yeah. but you're the project lead so you're the, you're the spearhead right yeah 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 it's um i i think of it more of that i get to represent this awesome group of people rather than that they are uh, than the other way around. Fair enough. And you know what? That's what makes you a fantastic leader is you're <laughs> humble as well. Hey, Matthew, seriously, thank you for taking the time to come here and, and explain all of this and, and talk about it as we, as we roll on to Fedora 34. We'll get you back before Fedora 35. Yeah, thanks. I'd love to be there. 1-855-450-NOAH. It's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Uh, Daniel writes in and says, Hello, Noah. First of all, thank you for your work on the Linux community. I run a small home lab where I virtualize some servers. Some of them are accessible via my domain. I would like to use another server I'm setting up at my parents' house as a backup server for my entire home lab. There are a lot of obstacles I'm facing, and I'm afraid I'm reinventing the wheel with my approach. I wrote a small script that sets up a VPN connection, and I use a Docker container Linux server with WireGuard between the two networks. Then it copies all the data I want to copy using rclone. 
I've added additional cron jobs to keep only one yearly, three monthly, and four daily copies of my configuration and personal data files. Do you know of any open source tools that can do something like this? My concern is that I'm creating security issues as I have little experience in this area. Kind regards, Daniel. So honestly, Daniel, what you're doing is really not that far off from how a lot of businesses back up their data. The difference is a lot of times the site-to-site -site VPN will be put into place and so they're not calling it with a script, but doing it that way doesn't really hurt anything. You want this, you want the data to be offsite. You want it to be automated. So therefore you kind of arrive by default at a VPN. And, and I, I get, you don't know what you don't know. And so that's why you're asking. Um, but anytime I, anytime somebody asks a security question, my answer usually back is, well, what is the, what is the suspected threat vector? And so, yeah, there's a VPN link between your parents' house and yours. And if somebody compromises your parents' place and you have bi-directional data on that VPN link, then yeah, it could potentially be a security hole. Um, as far as other solutions that are out there, Bacula is, is a great system to use. Um, Snap, if you're doing snapshots, you might be able to send those over the wire, depending on what virtualization technology you're using. And, uh, or ZFS send, if you had a free NAS box on each send, you might be able to use ZFS Send to move data back and forth. Hey, if uh, you if you're looking for more open source and Linux related content, I invite you to check out my friend and producer of the show, JT Pennington. He released released a new episode of the Opinion Dominion. You can get the latest episode at theopiniondominion.org/slash36. It's a discussion with Andy Yen about deplatforming. Go ahead and check it out. Hey, you can follow us on Twitter at Ask Noah Show. You can follow me personally at Kernel Linux. The music in my ear means we're out of time, but we record the show every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central. You can join us live at AskNoahShow.com. The show continues. You can download the entire back catalog as well as get all of the show notes, podcast.asknoahshow.com. We'll see you next week. <laughs>